People are always asking me, did I know it was going to be a landmark film? No, I did not, and I didn't care. I couldn't have cared less. I think Orson knew it was going to be important. But uh, after all, it was my first movie, and I was so thrilled to be in a movie, and with Orson Welles. I mean, that was all I, that was my prize right there. And I was just living in the now. You know, they always say, live in the moment. That's the thing to do. And it's the one time in my life when I absolutely, completely, and utterly did. I was away from my family. I was alone in Hollywood and could give all my time and all my thought to the movie, which I certainly did. And I loved every minute of it, but it was a very relaxed set. First of all, it was a closed set. Now, I had no idea what that meant until I made pictures after that. There was absolutely nobody allowed on the set except the cast and the director, and, and the producer couldn't come on. And nobody, not any of the brass, the biggest people in RKO couldn't. No publicity people, no columnists, no newspaper people, nothing. And it, believe me, it's a big difference when you have all this hustle and bustle with everybody coming and going and wanting your time and wanting your attention. In fact, whenever anybody did come on, uh, kind of bearded the lion in his den, as it were, they had a softball and some gloves, and they would start throwing the ball around. And they'd say, if you don't want us to waste time, get off the set and we'll go back to work. That was his uh, edict, and he was able to enforce it. Nor was anybody allowed to see uh, rushes, which uh, that was a very unknown thing, because everybody, as soon as you finished, you went to see the rushes from the day before. And in a way, it was helpful because you could uh, judge your what was going on and how it was happening, if you wanted to make any changes in your character or your makeup or your whatever. But he thought that without, with our not being used to it, we'd be too self-conscious, and he was probably right. Anyway, none of us saw one single foot of film until we saw it on the screen when it was opened. One of the people on All My Children asked me one time, they had just seen Citizen Kane for the first time. And of course, I am very together and very grand. And he said, how on earth, that was your first movie? I don't believe it. How could you be that together at that time? I said, well, I hadn't let any man in to mess up my life. But then <laughs> I was a very composed person. In fact, I did seem older than my years. Now I'm trying to do it the other way around. I'm having my salad days now when I'm older. But um, I had studied as a, to be an actress, to be a stage actress. And I knew about acting deportment. I wasn't just some little girl off the street. And being with Orson, you just had that feeling of being your stature, your delivery, your, your uh, posture. That's one thing I always did have, but that was lucky in a way. I had had a curvature in my spine as a child, so I had to wear back braces for about two years from I was seven till nine, and that gave me this very erect posture. And if you can hold on to that, you don't get old, which is uh, very good, and it's very helpful, too. The first day I walked onto the set, they were down there. We were shooting on this huge stage where Astaire and Rogers used to do their musicals. And of course, we needed just a little tiny plot in the middle of it. Uh, and uh, the lights were on, and there were the two of them. Orson was there in makeup and dressed, and uh, Greg was there, and they were giggling like a couple of kids in a sandbox. I mean, they loved each other, and they were so inventive together, and they just loved doing what they were doing. When they wanted to get the cameras from, you know, really floor level, the camera sits on something like this, so it isn't floor level. So they'd cut out a hole in the wooden floor and dig the dirt out themselves, you know, and put the candle down into the hole. And they were just, they loved each other because they were both creative geniuses. And they listened to each other and tried things together. And Greg never got over not working with Orson. He didn't live an awful long time after that, although he was a young man. I could understand everything that Orson did. He was so wise and uh, such a... For instance, I, when I asked him about the baby and he gave me that philosophy of life, and then uh, he said, well, as a matter of fact, the most important thing you can ever do in your life is to find out what is your heart's desire. Now, that sounds simple, but he said it really isn't. We lie to ourselves all the time. We really camouflage what our deepest heart's desire is because we are afraid to say it. We're either too shy or we think, 
oh, I could never do that, or I can't be that bold. But he said, keep digging till you find it, and then follow it, because that's what the Lord created you to do and to be. And people will say, Orson talking about God? I said, well, of course. He was a very spiritual man, not a religious man, quote, unquote, but a very spiritual man. He also said, all the education you'll ever need is if you know the Bible. I mean, really know it, not just read it now and then. Know the Bible and know Shakespeare. That's all you need to know for life. And I don't know how many people ever really know both of those things except Orson, but it's a very good rule of thumb. Well, the biggest break as an editor was Citizen Kane, of course. Uh, I had done several very good films before that, uh, but that was, of course, the became such a renowned film over the years and a film that many people think is maybe the best film ever made. So that was obviously my best, best assignment and biggest break. And working with Orson was you know, quite an experience. I got a call one day from my boss and uh, he said, come over to the office, I want to see you. And I came over uh, to see him. I just finished uh, somebody up there likes me, no, uh, my favorite wife, with Cary Grant and Irene Dunn. And uh, he said, uh, you know this Orson Welles fella? I said, well, yeah, I know about him. I, I know he's done a lot to make a film. I know about his reputation from the stage and all, but I don't know him. He said, well, he's pulled a fast one on the studio. I said, what do you mean, a fast one? He said, well, he got an OK from the studio to shoot three what he called test scenes for his new film he's going to make. And he shot the scenes, and they've looked at them, and they realize he's shooting his picture. They're actually sequences for the picture. So they've given him a, a green light to go ahead and make it, and he wants a new editor. Jimmy, uh, my boss, had been signed rather old-time hack editors to these so-called tests, and I guess Orson wanted somebody younger and newer and fresher, maybe his own age. So I was sent down to meet him at uh, the old dark Pathé studios in Culver City where he was shooting on Kane, and uh, he came out from the set. And I met him and uh, chatted for a few minutes. When I got back to the studio, they said, you've got the job. And that started a very interesting period of my life, I must say. <laughs> when you're working on a film, you're so kind of clued in on the film itself that I wasn't aware of too much going on until the picture was all finished and done. And then I had quite an interesting experience in terms of the intrigue and the concern about the, around the business about this being the story of uh, William Randolph Hearst. I got a call uh, one, uh, one Monday morning from Jimmy, my boss, and he said, listen, we, they need a print of Kane in New York right away. Big, big thing, you've got to, can you get on a plane tonight and go to New York? And I did, I took a, a print to New York and the purpose of this trip and taking the print there was to take it to the, over to the music hall where they had a projection room for showings and uh, to show the, the picture, show Citizen Kane to all the chairman of the boards of the picture company, all the big heads of the companies because the, the men running the studio halls were all vice president in charge of production. These were the top people, the skinks and the Kents, people like that, to show the film to, to those men and their lawyers to see whether they would say to RKO, in the interest of our business, the safety of it is put this on the shelf and don't release it, or to give them a go-ahead, go release it. That's what it was all about. And that's when I first realized the, the, the size of the potential, uh, or the size of the concern and potential problem. I'm the only man from Hollywood ever saw Orson give one of his best performances. At this first showing, where the, the, all the headmen were there and their wives and lawyers, they came. Orson was there, and he spoke to him for about five minutes, and I can't tell you anything he said. But, you know, Orson, when he wanted to be, so, could be so charming and so winning, and I think, he, I think he had his battle half won by the time he left that room. He didn't stay for the showing, of course, but he, he made a marvelous pitch. 